Yes, show and tell. Yeah, I bring toys anywhere I go. All right. And today my toys are very physical. I'm, I'm excited. to 10th Magnitude's Manhattan's Project. I'm Michael Gibson, Marketing Manager here at 10th Magnitude. I am joined today by our VP of Cloud Solutions, uh, Brian Blanchard. Thank you very much for joining us. We don't get you very frequently because uh, you don't work out of here in Chicago, but uh, thanks for joining. I appreciate yeah, stopping thanks by. Thanks for having me. Much appreciated. I understand you're, you're here about some IoT, Internet of Things mm -hmm. stuff. <laughs> um, can you give us a quick, a quick high level of, of how Azure and IoT are related? Like what in Azure uh, allows people to be empowered to implement uh, IoT projects? Okay, so uh, in my opinion, IoT is the next cloud. I mean, it's, it's right at that precipice of, of really emerging as a technology and an industry change agent. And what the cloud does to facilitate that is there's this, this uh, collection of tools inside of Azure called the IoT Hub. Mm -hmm. So they, they contain a service bus, event hubs, all of these other technical pieces that we could talk uh, at great lengths about. Okay. But essentially what, what they do is they enable this flow of communication from devices in the field to a central location to some form of business intelligence and then back out to users or even back out to the devices. So a great scenario of that is, let's say that I have a watch that counts how many steps I take. Okay. Well, that's great if I can see how many steps I take. But if everybody's wearing a watch and we send all of those up to the cloud, a doctor could take that, that data point and he could assimilate that and find out which patients are most at risk of diabetes from lack of activity. Mm -hmm. uh, who, who isn't get enough, getting enough exercise aligned with medical treatment? Mm -hmm. And they could see that from a centralized console because all that data is coming together in real time. So the, the power of IoT and what the cloud enables is I can get that, that data from the field to a person that can really assimilate that data and make sense of it so much faster. So what, what I'm seeing really commonly in the service space is if I have data about something I made and put out in the field, I can make a better product. So, so that's one great point. I can have that product be more intelligent and I can support it better, I can troubleshoot it better. But what gets really cool is when you can use that data to change your customer's business. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the conversations that I had just yesterday was around my 1% one one theory. And okay, and what is your 1% theory? So the 1% theory is that in IoT, we change a business by changing 1% of gross revenue or 1% of gross margins. Okay. So looking at your business, looking out in the field, looking at your customers, what is that one thing that if you could change it for them, it's going to generate 1% change for you? And, and huge. how do you identify that? Uh, we do that through some, some processes that we've developed for interactive opportunity assessment and identification. So what we did yesterday is held a workshop for some technical and business leaders for one of our customers, and we walked through their customer's world. So, and I can't talk about what that product was, but, sure. but we, we stood in the shoes of their customer, and we said, well, what do they do that's important? What is it that, that would change the world for them? What is it about your product they like? What is it about your product that they hate? And let's find, of all those things that are opportunities to improve the product, what is the one that they would pay for tomorrow? Not huge amounts, but what would they pay for now? So generally, those come down to things like, um, they use my product to accomplish this thing over here. Well, as they're going through that process, there's a pain point right here that I can't address, and no product in the world can address it. But if I had a service where I could do that for them better than they could do it for themselves, I can charge them a monthly recurring revenue for that. And I can offer a service that complements my product, and it's not gonna double my sales. It's gonna add 1% to my gross margin by adding 5% to 20% of my customers. Hmm. If I'm doing my math right there. Okay. <laughs> but, but a service that fills that unique need that only you can offer because only you have the data from all of the customers in the field. So now as you're aggregating that data, uh, it's, it becomes akin to what IBM used to produce in the red books. So IBM used to go out into the market and say, well, we've seen the most effective accountants in the field execute this practice. Well, as an accountant who only act, executes the practices that you know, you do things your way. 
But IBM would come in and say, hey guys, you know, if we do this a little bit differently, you become more efficient. That was an example of a service that they did that, that offered 1%. Mm -hmm. And they did it because they had the software that aggregated all of the data points from all of the different accounting companies and you know, all over the world. Okay. So if we can do the same thing for your customers that are consuming your product and help them identify new opportunities based on the data, then we can find those priorities. And that's the, that's the type of workshop that we did yesterday. Not so much about the technology. The Azure makes the technology easy. It was about what can we do that changes the life of your customer, and what can we do on that list of things that changes their life that would make them want to purchase or acquire an ongoing service from you that you could deliver based on the data to make their life easier. All right, so so you, you brought some stuff for show and tell. Yes. So, yeah. so what, what exactly are we working with here? So, so this is actually part of a POC we're building out now, okay. and a small part of a POC that I built out in the past. Okay. So just kind of walking through a few pieces. This here is a Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. Man, I feel like the guys on uh, uh, the Shop at Home TV channels. Oh yeah, the, yes, home, the home Shopping Network. Yeah, the Home Shopping Network. Well, welcome to my Raspberry Pi. Please buy this device. And, and how much are those <laughs> going for, Brian? <laughs> well, you can get this wonderful device for right under sixty-five dollars. That's fantastic. <laughs> buy yeah. one today. Now, yeah. all joking aside. Okay, so this is a, a Raspberry. Pi device. I okay. have it in a protective case because I tend to spill things and don't sure. really want to electrocute myself or others nearby. I will, I will move this over. Yeah, yeah, actually, the case keeps it pretty darn safe. Okay. Right. So, so this is a very small form factor computer, uh, really small motherboard, processor memory, all the things you'd see in a, in a computer, really similar to what's running inside your phone. What we're doing with this is we're, we've installed a Wi-Fi dongle to connect to the internet. And we've pinned off some cables off of this to use a, a serial connection or protocol referred, referred to as UART. Okay. Um, we're, we're connecting those cables up to a simple little prototype breadboard here so we can manage some cabling pieces here and prepare for when we solder the final component. Sure. So it's a little messy now. It gets cleaner when we're done. And on board here we have a chip that's converting uh, basic electrical impulses to a number. Okay. So this is what's giving us a number to be consumed by the device. On the other end of that chip, it runs back through these cables here, which run all the way over to this wonderful little gadget that I have in my hands here. Okay, and what is what is this? So this is what changes their customer. So with okay. this particular company, they're in a business where water is a big component of what they do. Okay. For environmental purposes, for financial purposes, for productivity purposes, they need to understand the consumption of water in day-to-day -day activities. So we're installing this on their product, and this is, is a simple flow meter. So it's about a $150 flow meter. Okay. Uh, there's cheaper ones out there, but we're using this for the prototype. And basically, as water comes in the spout, it turns these little spindles. That, I don't know if you can see that on the camera or not. So it's like, it's like a but, little uh, water wheel. Yeah, 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 it's like a little miniaturized water mill. Okay. But instead of uh, grinding grain or turning a wheel or anything like that, it's, it's doing some things inside of this device to convert the amount of water to electrical pulses. So, so many liters of water is so many pulses over this cable. Okay. So that pulse comes out of here as an electrical impulse, goes back into our board, goes into this chip, which converts it to a number that says, I've now consumed a liter of water, or a thousand liters of water, okay. whatever that may be. All right. That number is continuously pushed, and it just says one liter, two liters, seven liters, one liter, and just shows the constant volume of water. Okay. That water goes into our Raspberry Pi here, All right. which uh, basically we have a really thin, lightweight, C-sharp application that's running on Windows 10 IoT Core on this device. So even though it's made by Google, it's running Windows 10. That's running Windows 10? Uh, IoT Core. Okay. So there's no interface, so, okay. but okay. all the underpinnings. So we're running a C-sharp application that just has a simple little interface that shows how much water's coming through. Okay. And as that number is recorded, we take that number and we wrap it in a JSON package so that we can ship it over the wire. And using a secure encrypted channel, we're continuously pushing those packages out saying one liter of water, two liters of water, seven liters of water, one liter of water. And so what that does is it, it goes from a rear view mirror look at how much water did my guys consume based on how much I bought six months ago or three days ago or however fast your BI cycle is to how much water are my guys consuming right this second. Well, with this one, we're consuming it and we're running it through something called Azure Stream Analytics. And what Stream Analytics does is it can give us a notification of threshold violations. So if 10 liters of water is too much water for this device to consume, meaning someone's doing something wrong, mm -hmm. we can raise an alert using Stream Analytics. So like left it on or they, they set something up incorrectly. Exactly. Or, okay. Or, or if this is something that should stop working and stop consuming water after 5 p.m. so everybody's gone home, 
We can raise an alert that says after 5 p.m. when you're consuming too much water. Is this just is this just reporting, or can you interact with this? Could could you, for instance, have have this mm -hmm. hooked up and, and and get the the volume that's being consumed, and then also have a mechanism by which you can see that and then send a signal, say, oh, it's after 5 p.m. Somebody left this on. I need to shut this down and then turn it off remotely to prevent yeah. it from continuing to consume yes. uh, resources. Absolutely. So in Azure Stream Analytics, we can capture those alerts and we can pass those off to Power BI so that we're showing the data and people can see it and use that to make longer term decisions. But we can also go to that next level of intelligence and we can say that if this is something that we can stop or we can prevent or change, we can pipe a signal back down to the Raspberry Pi, have another set of cables coming off another side that controls the servo motor. And that servo motor can turn off the water. So there's all kinds of ways that we can use stream analytics and another tool set called machine learning to predict behaviors, identify anomalies, and then send that message back to the device or to other applications to react accordingly. With, with the flow meter here, we're going to help the customer of this particular product or the guys that sell the, the product that's using this, this sensor to better conserve water, be better stewards of the environment. Make sure that they're not overusing a resource that, that's well contended in places like California. So providing environmental stewardship as well as controlling their costs, making sure that people are getting their jobs done, and ultimately taking what right now their product does on its own and helping that purchaser of their product provide that outcome as a service. And we're doing all that with just raw data coming that, out of sensors. That is very cool. So so 10th Magnitude's IoT, we, we are Captain Planet and executive board approved essentially like we're, we're protecting essentially, the environment we're protecting yeah. revenue we're that's fantastic that's really cool what's what's your what's your dream like what what's your 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 target okay so i'm a little bit sick but creating skynet inside of azure sounds really compelling okay. <laughs> so so we can't talk about any of the details of these ones but there mm -hmm. are a few customers that have uh, personal and national defense products that we are aligning with the same type of technology so essentially 10m is Captain America, but, or Captain Planet, but we were also weaponizing the cloud. <laughs> and definitely an exaggeration of the concept. Okay, but, all right. But if, if we could take something like a personal defense device and make it to where it's smarter, so mm -hmm. that if somebody's being mugged and they use that personal defense device, it can calculate the body mass of the individual, or it can calculate um, presence of drugs or testosterone or uh, any other foreign substance in the body that would make the standard voltage of that device ineffective. Mm -hmm. And we can pump that up to the cloud, run it through machine learning, back down to the device to adjust the voltage to make sure, one, that if you if you zap a kid with this, they don't die. Sure. But two, to also make sure that if you've pulled this out and you've used it on somebody, it's going to incapacitate them. I mean, that's really important. That could save lives. Yeah, so I you can even like reach out, you can even reach out to emergency services. It could. Like yeah. just throw up a GPS flare of, of the usage location for it. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're really not weaponizing the cloud. No, but, no. But if we could make a personal defense device protect a grandmother in a way that really wouldn't have done by just having a dummy device that was just an on-off button, and we could do so without increasing the cost and do so in near real time. So between the time she squeezes the trigger and those electrodes make contact and, and within a millisecond or two of that electrical charge starting, we've adjusted it. We could save a life, either hers or the person that she's inadvertently zapped. Wow. So I, I, I feel like I have, I have learned a ton about IoT. I mean, I, I already knew a, a good chunk. This is something I've been curious about. Um, but I, I, I cannot thank you enough for for the demonstration, for for the the case uh, case studies, uh, how, and 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 sort of what we can do with this. This is really cool. Wonderful. Thanks for having me. Thanks I very much for the the Manhattan's. Yeah. Great. Right. Thanks for coming out. Cheers. Thanks, guys.